Uh, morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, uh, once again, thank you very much. Uh, so my job is uh, uh, now made easy since Professor Bajrasari has already talked about higher education. Uh, I, I was just wondering, and I had made a few tables, but no need for that now. So I'll focus only on school education. Uh, just to guide you very quickly through, you know, some of the major political events. Uh, I mean that that could probably put a context into how we understand education in Nepal and education development in Nepal. So, uh, I mean, 1740 AD onwards is uh, when uh, actually uh, the, the country that we call Nepal was uh, the, the course of, uh, you know, annexing the various um, principalities and, and, uh, and then creating a greater Nepal started. And then in 1816, I mean, that, um, that was stopped. So the present day demarcation of the boundaries uh, was actually fixed in 1816 when we lost the war to British Raj. And then in 1854 was the start of an 144 year old uh, Rana rule. So this was a hierarchical rule uh, for 104 years. In 1951, we had the first, uh, uh, first democratic revolution. We have had many uh, to overthrow you know, the Ranas. Uh, and then, um, uh, so it was multi-party democracy with consti constitutional monarchy. And then in 1961, um, that multi-party democracy was dissolved. And then the king, uh, he instituted what he called a partyless panchayat system of governance for the next 30 years. So we had a second, bow, a second round of uh, democratic movement in 1990 to overthrow the king, and, um, but still have a multi-party democracy with constitutional monarchy. And then we had, uh, from 1996 to 2006, a decade of Maoist insurgency. So in 2006 and in 2003, the, the king again um, wanted to have autocratic rule. And then in 2005, six, there was a revolution to overthrow the king. And then we, uh, we have what, what was this, the third Lok Tantric movement. Yeah. And uh, so, um, and then it, Nepal was declared a federal um, republic. In 2015, we had the constitution promulgated. And then in 2017, we had the elections. And then uh, now we are in transition to federalism. So that's the basic con uh, context. Now, one of the things that I want to highlight in this paper uh, is, uh, I mean, you know, this, uh, the institution of the modern school. So, uh, I mean, like Bhutan, I mean, we, we had a you know, strong history of um, uh, religious education um, in all traditions, in Buddhist, uh, you know, Hindu, and uh, Islam. So all three traditions of uh, um, these religious education institutions were there, but I mean the the general tendency uh, to uh, was to portray Nepal as an education virgin land. So I mean, uh, you know, Nepal was uh, uh, I mean uh, isolated for a long time. So whatever forays were made by foreigners into Nepal at various times during the Rana rule. So uh, so one of the classic you know off-sided uh, portrayal of Nepal's education is to portray it with snakes in Iceland. So saying that th there was th there were none. Yeah, no, no schools in, in Nepal. And then, so uh, this uh, guy, Hugh Brian Wood, who actually was uh, invited to, uh, to support with the development of a national education system in 1951. So what he had to say was, uh, Nepal has come in the middle of the 20th century with virtually no education. Uh, and then, so she was relatively free to design her own system to meet the needs of her people. And this was, in his words, a textbook case of education uh, uh, education development if there ever was one. Yeah. But I mean, this is uh, not to say that, you know, like uh, prior to 1951, I mean, there were no reforms uh, at, uh, you know, no experiments with uh, trying to design a national system of education. So we started in 1902 uh, or with what, what were then called the Bhasa Patsalas, yeah? literally language schools. And then, uh, so this, uh, uh, the debate on, uh, you know, using Nepali, or at that time it was called Gorkha language, yeah? uh, as, a, as a medium of, medium of instruction, and then developing textbooks in Nepali language, uh, it, it actually started in 19, uh, 1902. And then, I mean, there's a very strong connection to Darjeeling and um, uh, Banaras, you know, uh, in, the, in the development of Nepali language and its sub subsequent institution in, 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 in Nepal. And then uh, in 1905, so, uh, you know, based on the Macaulay uh, version, so we had our own versions of Sresta Patsalas, or these clerical schools. And then um, towards the end of the Rana rule in 1947, so the Ranas, they, they tried to experiment with, you know, these uh, basic or other schools. So, I mean, these are some of the developments before 1951. And then, uh, so uh, post-1951, um, 
so uh, I mean, even the Nepalese, you know, they started portraying that Nepal had no, virtually no system of education. And then, so uh, the desire was to look to the West. Yeah? Uh, and uh, it was the United States Operations Mission who actually, you know, supported in the, in the, uh, in the formation of a National Education Planning Commission, uh, especially the University of Oregon. So, I mean, there's a lot written about that, so I, I'll just skip this very quickly. Uh, so uh, the post-1951 education, I mean, it, it, ha uh, it is strongly influenced by, uh, you know, advice from uh, the Americans. And then, uh, so after 1960, uh, so what happened was, you know, between 1951 and 1960, so even if the government was trying to institute a national universal and uniform system of education, so there was still a, a, a large variety of schools in place. So, you know, there were Sanskrit schools, there were uh, English schools, there were Vasa Patsalas, there were Shrestha, I mean, so it was, uh, there were a lot of different type of schools. And I mean, even in Kathmandu, Hindi was still a medium of instruction. So, uh, and, and the political economy of the late 1950s, you know, and the desire of Nepal to be a modern state and then to have as more foreign diplomatic relations as, as it could. So, so that led to Nepalizing the education uh, system uh, after, after the 1960s. So, which was like use of Nepali as a, a medium of instruction and then, you know, like uh, rewriting the history. So, I mean, these are all different paths. I just want to, uh, I just want to highlight here. And uh, so, mm, yeah, so there was excessive emphasis on nationalizing the schools and uh, introducing nationalistic elements into education and then uh, using that education to build, you know, uh, what they call matosuna of the school or, you know, uh, an education that is suited to the, to the soil of the land. Uh, and then, uh, so we see that even after 2000, so this trend of secularizing religious institutions, so uh, that, that continues to happen. Yeah? So, you know, madrasas, uh, gurukuls and gumbas uh, that... Uh, want to receive grants from uh, the government. So they have to uh, comply with the official curriculum and the official textbooks. So, I mean, since 1951 and even before that, you know, th this whole notion of um, trying to institutionalize the modern school. So that's one part. The other part relates to, you know, like, okay, this conundrum between the community and the, the state with respect to how the schools are established and how the schools are uh, operated. Uh, I mean, um, there is actually history of the, uh, the Nepali state establishing only about 400 schools. Yeah? And we now have 34,000 plus schools. So the rest were all established and operated by the community. And um, oh, I don't have much time, so I don't, I don't want to read a, a, a quote from my paper. But it was like basically, you know, um, the, um, the educated people in the community, they would take the lead in uh, identifying a place, collecting children, and then, you know, um, having a shed, uh, you know, running the school in a shed, and then would go back to the government saying, now, okay, we have run class one, now please give us permission, and then please give us authority, so, and they would give the textbooks, the teachers, in a, in a gradual manner, so that's, that's the way. Uh, uh, yeah, I have already talked about this, and then, um, so there have been these bouts of centralization, decentralization, yeah, so the nationalization of the 1960s was actually uh, to a centralization, and then in the in the 1980s, we again started with decentralization. Uh, I want to move quickly to uh, developments post 1990. So, I mean, this is a particular you know particularly interesting period. I mean, both you know on the world scale because Nepal committed to the Education for All movement, and also because of the political changes. So uh, they resulted in an increase in donor and government funding for um, basic education. And this is also the period when we see an increasing you know, privatization of education. So both privatization of education and privatization in education. Yeah? And uh, from the different perspectives of uh, you know, um, for profit and with uh, legitimacy. And uh, then we can also see an, the rise of what I call an Ardha Sarkari public schools. Yeah? So semi-public public schools. Uh, I'll, I'll talk more about that a little later. Uh, public financing, so uh, basically uh, the, uh, we see a declining share. Uh, I'll, I'll show that in the graph. So this actually is the graph that shows you know, um, the, the um, share for education as percentage of the national budget since 1975 till now. Uh, and uh, as, a, as a share of GNP, uh, GDP is less than 4% in the, in the recent years. So uh, two things, I mean, you know, like the Nepali state's capacity to fully finance public education is insufficient. Uh, inequitable and questionable. So, and uh, um, the evidence for that is uh, one actually comes from, you know, how the teachers are deployed. So teachers make up the largest share of any education budget. So if you look at the provision of teachers, I mean, we see a large number of schools that actually public schools, but without teachers 
without publicly funded teachers. Uh, I have the table in the in the paper itself, so you can you can go to that. And then uh, so so whatever schools were you know established or upgraded after 1990. So what they are doing is they are relying on these RAT and PCF teachers. Uh, so these are you know uh, not permanent and and even privately funded teachers. And basically, because uh, you know the, the very notion of community taking the lead in establishing the school meant that, so the most marginalized communities would be taking uh, that step um, towards the end rather than um, in the beginnings because you know of the social and political capital associated with uh, trying to establish a school. Uh, yeah, so this is the structure of education, uh, you know, like so uh, we have uh, we used to have a five years primary plus three years lower secondary, two years secondary, and two years higher secondary. I think this is uh, quite common to the region as a whole. And now we have you know uh, eight years of basic and four years of secondary, and then uh, an additional year of uh, year or more of ECED. Uh, improvements in access and equity. So um, I just put the figures for two years, you know, 1951 and uh, 2017. So you can see a 111 fold increase in you know, the number of primary schools, uh, 836 plus fold increase in the number of secondary schools, and then we have gender parity, MET, um, enrollments you know, almost universal at um, primary level, and increasing, you know, uh, increasing at secondary. By secondary here, the data is only for 9 to 10. I just have two minutes left. I mean, these are the data for you know, learning achievement. Uh, uh, so uh, since 2011, Nepal started conducting these uh, standardized assessment tests uh, on a sample basis. So these are the results for grades three, five, and eight in, in some of in these subjects. And they basically have been low. And, uh, and one of the problem is they have not improved over the years. So uh, one of the questions that we can ask of the system is, again, I mean, what has been the value add of the education system you know, as students progress through the years? Again, I mean, I mean uh, a lot of this is a gloomy picture, but I, I hope to end with some rays of hope. Uh, so this is the SLC pass rates. Uh, um, I mean, uh, it's, it's been 86, uh, 90 years actually, we started having these board examinations at the end of grade 10. And um, uh, uh, for the last four years, we have actually switched to a grading system, you know, uh, rather than a passing failing system. And this is the data for the last, uh, 30, uh, last 86 years, you know. So, uh, this is actually, you know, the number of years in which this was the pass percentage. So for the majority of years, you know, like um, we have pass percentage in the range of 30 to 40. So this is the average pass percent for students. And then there are, you know, like uh, low, uh, low achievements in math, science, and English, uh, high disparities between male and female, and between private and public schools. Yeah. And this, I mean, you can see the same results in, uh, in, in, the, in the subjects here, you know. So, I mean, no matter which way you test the students, the achievements in math, science, and English are the same. And private sector as a key, a key player, I, I just want to go very quickly through this. So, you know, uh, as you go higher up in the level, so the share of private uh, sector is, uh, is it, it increases, and then um, it, well, it, it, most of them are what you, uh, we can call it as a company current of the private, um, you know, education. So uh, schools uh, established as companies and then for profit. And then, so what has also happened is establishment of new public schools in urban areas is, has been rare. So it's, it's been uh, this, you know, um, um, understanding of the government that, you know, so, oh, I have still two minutes. That's good. I, <laughs> this one is zero, so. <laughs> So, I mean, so whatever, you know, uh, public, uh, in, in urban areas, population growth, uh, like in Kathmandu, in the last 10 years, the, the, the population of Kathmandu has more than doubled. Yeah? But if you look at the number of public schools that were established in Kathmandu in the last 10 years, only two new. Yeah? So, I mean, it's, it's somehow been an implicit and explicit understanding of the government that, you know, like, so um, um, students in urban areas will automatically go to public schools. Private schools, sorry. I mean, so this is the growth in uh, enrollments and growth in the number of private schools uh, since 1990. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it's exponential, actually. Uh, now, current issues. Uh, so I just want to, you know, like uh, um, highlight a few issues. Uh, I mean, uh, again, these have already been highlighted, uh, in a sense, in the, in the previous slides. So one is this growing public-private desire, uh, divide, and then, uh, you know, um, this increasing uh, uh, elements of the private sector, you know, being reflected in uh, within public schools. So, especially with respect to now, we can see an increasing number of public schools with uh, private provision. Uh, 
So the same school having uh, a medium of instruction in English, you know, which is uh, the hallmark of uh, English uh, private, private schools, and then having a Nepali medium of instruction, and then a pauperization of public schools, not in the sense that public schools are actually becoming poorer, but uh, you know, they are becoming places for the poor to study. Yeah? Uh, and, th and then there is evidence from the Living, living Standards Service to show that, which I have put in the table. Uh, the perpetual learning crisis, so I mean, it mainly stems from the neglect of basic education and then training for examination in the secondary grades. So, you know, we have these uh, inequalities within levels. Uh, uh, so, for example, the primary levels, uh, they would have the least qualified teachers and then, you know, they would be getting the textbooks. Uh, um, um, I mean, um, they, would, they would be the last ones to get the textbooks. So the attendance rates uh, in primary levels are low. So, uh, so I mean, there is, in a sense, you know, these um, inequalities uh, between um, uh, within uh, between different levels. Uh, so, with respect to teacher qualifications and with respect to other efficiency-related indicators uh, in uh, in the school, and then um, the teachers. I mean, this has been a per uh, perpetual crisis. So, we I mean, people talk about 17 different type of teachers that we have, and you know, like because. Uh, we have uh, systems in place for recruitment of teachers through the T Teacher Service Commission, but, but because that could not, uh, that has not been able to annually recruit, you know, the, the the vacancies annually fill the vacancies. So for a long time, so there have been these temporary teachers, and then uh, so uh, there has been a lot of politics involved in, you know, making them permanent, and then again lowering the qualifications, uh, and then. Um, this, you know, this oscillating emphasis on general versus technical vocational education. So that's also been one of the issues uh, which has been there since uh, 1951. And then um, one one of the issues that has now come uh, is with respect to governance. So how do you, you know, um, deal with uh, the functions of federal, provincial, and local governments in 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 the federal system? I mean, the constitution has said, okay, it's all local. But then um, education is also put as a concurrent function, and now you know there there have been differing political interpretations of uh, what functions to be kept at what levels, and especially you know the teacher issues uh, is is the one so that's uh, yet to be defined. Uh, finding some rays of hope, I mean, like uh, you know, uh, if you look at uh, the growth of education system, so I mean, um, it is uh, despite you know the the turbulence, uh, the political turbulence, and the, the social economic the additional that time is up through. now so there has been no adverse effects uh, that's one and then uh, yeah i mean the others you can you can uh, quickly go through yourself thank you very much so if you thank, have any questions